Thank you so much for that, in for that uh, introduction. Um, I get my thing working here. Is that working? Great. Um, it's a great honour to be here and give this talk today. I hope that it sparks some interest in some of you, and I hope that at the end um, there'll be time for questions. So if you have any questions, hold on to them. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the science that I do. I'm going to talk a bit about climbing mountains, because I can't help myself but mention that, and then a bit about training to be an astronaut. Okay, so let's kind of start at the beginning, though. What was I up to when I was your age or younger than you? Well, I wanted to go to Antarctica. That was my dream. I wanted to be an explorer. Um, I wasn't a great scientist, but I was really interested in stories of races to the Antarctic. So these are pictures of Scott and Shackleton racing from the South Pole to over 100 years ago. Um, and I don't know if you can read this, but this was an advert put in the newspaper by Shackleton trying to look for people to go with him on his expeditions. So I've modified it ever so slightly, as you can see. Um, but it said, men wanted, for a hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, <laughs> honour and recognition in case of success. And I thought, yeah, this is me, this is what I want to do with my life, I want to go to Antarctica, this is amazing, this is, this is my dream. Um, I put these photos up here just to make you feel better about your school uniform. Because this is me <laughs> in my school uniform, shocking as it is, uh, in the playground not so long ago. Um, and when I was at school, I wasn't great at science. <coughs> I was okay, but I wasn't, I wasn't in the top set. I wasn't great at it. Um, I really enjoyed science, though, and I loved sports. So um, I went to the National Academy for a sport called lacrosse. Um, and so this is, this is us playing up here. And we played lacrosse every day. I played every day or twice a day for 14 years of my life, actually, in the end. Um, but also netball and tennis and squash and athletics and cross country, you name it, I wanted to play that sport. So this is what I really enjoyed doing. I loved, I loved playing sport. But uh, I decided that I loved science and I wanted to work super hard and, and, and try and do a science degree. So I went to Imperial College London, which is, uh, which is a university in the middle of London that only teaches science, technology and medicine. So this was the right place for me and I went to study a physics degree there. And uh, I played lacrosse still, you know, I had my team up here, this is me, we played, we played as often as we could uh, in the national championships. And I decided that I was interested in looking at my skill set. And I think this is kind of an important thing for us all to think about as we go through our life. So at this point, I was really good at running, I was really good at lacrosse. But you'll find if you run every single day, you become so inflexible that you can't touch your toes. So age 18, I realized, oh my goodness, I can't touch my toes, this is terrible. So I decided I would take up a new sport, and you guys are probably familiar with wushu. Um, I'm guessing that some of you do wushu actually at this, at this school. I thought I was, I was going to take up wushu. And uh, so as many of you know, this is a fairly tough sport for someone who has no flexibility. Um, we trained for you know, half an hour, an hour a day, stretching and stretching and stretching until finally we could do those moves where you jump in the air and land in the splits. You know. This was interesting for me to begin thinking about the things I'm really bad at, because I think it's quite important for us to do this. It's really easy to carry on doing the things you're good at, isn't it? And it's much harder to look at the things that you're bad at and work on those things specifically. So that's what I started to do way back at university. But I also had grown up thinking I liked astronomy. Thought I wanted to be an astronomer. I'd read books um, by famous astronomers like Stephen Hawking, and I tried to understand them, and I thought I wanted to be an astronomer. And then I had the chance to apply for an internship to work in the summer at NASA, which is what I did. But I accepted to work at NASA and spent two summers as an intern there, as an undergraduate, which totally changed my perspective. I was in a research group called the Heliophysics Research Group, and we studied planetary science. And that made me really think about the fact that I want to do the kind of science where we can send an instrument to find the answers. That's what I'm interested in, really. I want to be a planetary scientist. So I finished up my degree and headed to the University of Leicester, who have the biggest space science department in the country, and uh, started doing the space plasma physics PhD. Uh, but that also taught me some lots of really important lessons. So up until that point, I thought to myself that scientists have to sit in front of computer screens. That's what we do, we sit in offices in front of computer screens. And that's not really me. Like, I can hardly stand still while I'm giving you this talk. I like to move all the time, and, and sitting in front of a computer screen for the rest of my life was not what I wanted to do. But actually, I found out, as a space scientist, you don't have to. So this is me and my, my colleagues here. We're up on Iceland. We've built this radar system up here on Iceland. This is me uh, on Svalbard. Svalbard um, is a group of islands way north of Norway in the Arctic Circle. 
Someone has to be there all year round to operate this radar dish. And I made some interesting discoveries. I discovered that in the summer, when the sun is up and never goes down, this is a really nice place to go. That's when the professors go to Svalbard and operate the radar. And in the winter, when the sun never comes up and it's dark all the time, that's when the PhD students go to Svalbard to operate the radar. So I was there for three months in the winter. This is the only picture of me during daylight that exists. Um, there are thousands of polar bears and a small group of scientists. Um, doing work up there. So this made me think, actually as a planetary scientist, I get to go to interesting places, I get to travel the world. Maybe this is what I want to do with my life. And uh, I've been playing lacrosse, I've been running for a really long time, and I decided that it was time to, to try something different. So I decided that I wanted to take up high altitude mountaineering uh, as, as a hobby. So I saved all my, all my money and I bought lots of warm clothes and I bought a plane ticket to Argentina and decided I would try to climb the highest mountain in the southern hemisphere. Its name is Aconcagua. It's, it's 6,962 meters above sea level, so almost 7,000 meters. And the problem was I'd never climbed a mountain before, so I didn't really know how to do it. I didn't really know what I was doing. So, for example, if you were up at nearly 7,000 meters, you might take a step and then you might have to breathe three or four times, and then you might take another step, <laughs> and you might breathe three or four times. That's your rate of progress. So it's very slow because there's no oxygen up there. And so you get very cold because you aren't moving very fast. You have to think about the fact that you want to consume about 5,000 calories a day, but you've got to carry all those 5,000 calories you need to eat every day. So what kind of food do you need to eat? Or how do you keep your tent anchored to the ground when the big storms hit? threatening to carry your tent away with you inside it. So lots of things to think about, lots of things I learned really, really quickly when I decided to start climbing. So this photo, you can't really see the sort of grimace on my face here, but this photo is taken from the summit of that mountain. It took me about five weeks to crawl my way up to the summit. But started me on a massive journey of mountaineering that I've been on ever since. So I'm gonna talk a lot about mountains as we go through this talk. Um, so a year and a half later, I went to Alaska. That's where these photos are taken. So this, as you can see, this is a different kind of climbing. So um, there's a mountain called Denali or McKinley in Alaska. It's the highest mountain in North America. Um, and you can see it's different from this environment here. So if you look, I've just come up this region here. There's a crevasses and I've climbed up this ice face. I'm walking along this ridge. I've got an ice axe and crampons and a rope. So much more technical climbing now. So I began to learn technical climbing skills. And I was loving being a mountaineer. And so I began to think, you know, do I want to be a mountaineer or do I want to be a scientist? How is this going to work out? Well, you guys know how this ended because I was just introduced as a scientist, but I'll tell you more about the story. So I climbed this at the end of my PhD and then had to look for a job. And climbing mountains does not pay the bills. So I moved to the US, I moved to NASA as a research scientist. I worked at a place called Goddard Space Flight Center, which is near Washington, DC. And I arrived at NASA at, at a really perfect time, totally by mistake. I arrived there at the moment that a mission called Messenger arrived at the planet Mercury. And it had been on its journey for seven years. Some of my colleagues had been waiting seven years for it to arrive. And I kind of turned up with good timing right as it got there and began working in the research group that had built the instruments on board. So we were the first people to see the data when it came back, it came to us first. And so this was a great time to be working at NASA, a great time to be working on the planet Mercury. Um, as we got the data first, we made all sorts of fantastic discoveries about the planet and its environment. So this was a really exciting time for me in terms of work. I also had a really very supportive and very lovely supervisor, and he let me go to... Okay, hang on a moment. Let's fix this. I'm not sure why WhatsApp is doing this, but let's turn off the Wi-Fi. So... Uh, he let me go to the Himalayas. So this picture is in the Himalayas. Um, it's a mountain 11 miles from Everest, its name is Ahmed de Blanc. And if you look really closely, you can see there's sort of no easy route up that mountain. So this is a tough ice and rock mixed climb to get up to the summit here. So you're using ice axe and crampons to climb a mixture of ice and rock. This is tough climbing. And so I was learning again, learning new skills, continuing to climb, climbing harder mountains, and also doing more and more science. So again, trying to do both. Obviously though, if you want to go climbing, it's really important to stay fit and healthy. So a good way to do that, for me, was to take up rowing, because I live near a river. 
And so uh, my dad had been a rower a really long time ago, and um, he was always saying, you're wasting your time on the lacrosse pitch, you should be rowing, and uh, I'd ignored him for a long time. Uh, and then I thought, well, this is a good time, I live near a river in America, I'm going to take up rowing. So I became an elite, lightweight rower. What that means is, means getting up at four o'clock every morning, and driving to the boathouse and training for a few hours, and then driving to work. And then after work, maybe going back to the boathouse and training again before going to bed very early because I was getting up at four o'clock the next morning. And we did this every day. We slept until five on a Saturday, though, just to make you feel better. But really, every other day, it's a four o'clock start. So a really tough regime. But the reason I'm telling you this story with all these different activities is that this taught me an awful lot. It taught me how to be a good team player and how to be a good communicator. So if you've seen rowing, maybe you've seen it on television or maybe you've had a go, Rowing is a precision sport, so when every stroke has to be identical. If you're in a race, you might, you might race 3,000 strokes, and that right at the end of the race, you've got to be as technically brilliant as you were right at the start of the race, even though you're exhausted. And so this is all about precision. It's all about working hard and, and being precise with what you're doing. So this was a fantastic opportunity. We raced all over the world. We had all sorts of opportunities, and this was really amazing, but it taught me a lot about myself how to work in a team with other people. And you'll see later on, this came in handy. Okay, so a little bit about science. I want to tell you a bit about what I study. So I'm really interested in the interaction of the sun with the planets in our solar system. And I'm particularly interested in studying the inner planets in our solar system, which we call terrestrial planets. So that's Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and Mars. And so in this picture here, you can see here's the sun, and there's a hot gas that comes off the sun all the time. Um, called the solar wind, and it's flowing away from the sun, and it takes a couple of days to get to the Earth. This happens continually. But sometimes, bits of the solar surface explode outwards, and those explosions travel through the solar system and smash into the planets. And I want to know the impact on the planets of these explosions that happen. And so, on the right-hand side, we can see this is the Earth. This is the Earth's magnetic field in blue. And our magnetic field acts like a shield. It protects us from the most harmful effects of the sun. It makes the solar wind flow around the earth and protects us. But sometimes when there are big explosions, there are large impacts for us on the earth's surface. So this area of research is called space weather. And we actually produce a space weather forecast, just like a normal weather forecast, but we're looking at the sun to see what's coming from the sun. And so the kind of effect it can have for us Really big space weather events could damage our power grids, especially for countries at high latitudes, so northern Europe or Canada. It can damage our communication systems. It can make our GPS systems inaccurate. So when I, yesterday, decided to go for a little uh, walk around Hong Kong, I used my GPS. I would have been totally lost without my GPS system. I use it every single day. So now imagine my GPS system doesn't work properly or stops working entirely. Or, even worse, it's just inaccurate, so it makes me think I'm somewhere I'm not. That can have quite a big impact on me. But think also about the future, things like Amazon, who are going to deliver us our packages via drones, that kind of thing. It's really important that our GPS systems are accurate, so this can have quite a big impact on us. Um, it can damage satellites, either the instruments themselves or cause entire satellites to deorbit. So imagine how much impact that would have. And astronauts get a high dose of radiation, and I'm going to talk a bit more about why I care about astronaut health um, later on. So you can see that these things are all quite damaging to society. And the worst ever space weather event that we know of happened in the 1850s. It was called the Carrington event. And it was the biggest explosion we've ever seen from the sun. But the sun looked pretty normal. There was no advance warning this was going to happen. And in the 1850s, it didn't really matter because we weren't very dependent upon technology the way we are today. But if that event happened today, it would be very catastrophic for our society. These effects are not short-lived. If we damage all of the power grids, it's going to take weeks or months for our power grids to start working again. So imagine living without your electricity for a prolonged period. That's quite a profound impact on our society. So. This is uh, a plot that I really like. I'm not sure if you can read it, but I'll describe it to you. This is called the National Risk Register. And this is just an example from the UK government. They produce this every few years. And it's meant to catalogue the risks to society. 
So on the axis here, we've got likelihood of something happening in the next five years. And this axis gives us kind of a, a severity level. How bad would it be between one and five? So to show you some examples, severe wildfires in the UK are not very likely. It rains a lot, I'm sure you know. So there's a probability of one in 2,000 to one in 200 of a big wildfire happening in the UK. And if it does happen, we've got a severity level of two. So it's not going to be too serious if it does happen. At the other end of the scale, pandemic flu up here. Likelihood, one in two to one in 20 of happening in the next five years and very serious for humanity. This is a very lethal um, potential pandemic. Okay, so there is severe space weather on the list, on the grid. Same likelihood as pandemic flu. Severity level three or four. So you can see people are beginning to understand how much we depend on our technology and how bad a space weather event could be. And this is great for us because it means that people are realizing that our research area is really significant. So I mentioned that I study the planet Mercury and you're probably asking to yourselves now, why did you study Mercury? Well, the reason is Mercury sits in here, about a third of the distance from the sun to the earth. And Mercury has a really weak magnetic field. So Mercury sees that worst possible space weather event, that Carrington event, every day. And that event happens on the Earth every 150 years. So I'm trying to understand the physics behind what's happening at Mercury so I can apply that knowledge to us here on the Earth and help protect our infrastructure. That's what I do. And so this mission I'm really excited about, this is the latest mission that we've just launched to Mercury. Its name is Becky Colombo, and it launched six months ago heading for the planet Mercury. It's a really different mission because we're sending two spacecraft together to the planet. We've never done this before at any other planet. So two spacecraft bolted together fly to Mercury, and when they get there, they split apart and orbit the planet separately. Again, we've never done that before. Um, the reason I'm really excited is because we built this instrument that's sitting on board that mission. This instrument is an X-ray telescope, and it's designed to tell us what Mercury is made of. Mercury is a very unusual planet. It's very dense, the densest planet in our solar system. And we don't really understand what it's made of, how it formed and how it evolved. So our instrument is designed to do that. It measures X-rays coming off of Mercury's surface and uh, is designed to tell us what the planet is made of. And actually I'm really interested in studying craters. So in this picture here, this is a false color picture of composition as far as we know. And here I have a crater. Around that crater, you can see there's different material. So I'm going to simulate making a crater here. Here I'm just throwing an object into uh, a tray with different layers of colored powder. The yellow powder is existing underneath the surface. So when I make my crater, you can see some of that yellow stuff from under the surface gets lifted by the impact and lands on the surface. And there's this characteristic pattern you can see called rays which are like stripes of material coming away from the crater. So look at that pattern that's formed there, and then compare it with this one here. They're very similar. So this material here was, was brought to the surface when the crater was formed about four billion years ago. The magic part about this, though, is that this material came from under the surface of Mercury. And we're going to use our instruments to find out what this is. So that means we're going to be able to find out what the inside of Mercury is made of for the first time. It's really hard to know what the inside of a planet is made of without going there and digging some um, up and taking a look at it. So that's what our instrument is designed to do. So now I'm involved in building, designing and building this instrument and sending it to Mercury. Now it's me that has to wait seven years until it arrives. So we launched it six months ago. It will arrive in December 2025. So I want all of the students to think about how old you are now and add seven to that number and ponder where you might be in seven years' time and just think about the fact that I'm still going to be waiting. <laughs> I'm still going to be waiting for our spacecraft to get there. So. Just imagine how long these missions take. Okay. All right, so let's carry on. Let's carry on. It's a long duration mission. So, I'm designing a building system to go to Mercury, which is uh, you know, really a dream for me. 
But also, I wanted to keep on climbing. And these photos were taken about a year ago in the Andes in South America, which is where I like to climb. So I want to carry on climbing, and I want to keep on doing science. But I'm beginning to realize it's really hard to do both, because both of these things take up a lot of time. The other thing I have, though, is access to a resource that I had never had before, which is a supercomputer. So the university has three supercomputers. Each one is about 3,000 times my laptop, all connected together. So now I have the power of thousands of computers all at once. And I'm meant to be using the supercomputer to study Mercury and its environment, which I am. But I'm also really interested in, in mountains. So I decided that I would start to investigate where all the mountains are in South America. I have a friend and I are trying to climb all the mountains over 6,000 meters in the Andes. And the question is, how many are there? And where are the mountains? So, the previous list of mountains that exists was drawn up by a guy 30 years ago. He got a map of the Andes Mountains and a pencil, and he marked on the position of the mountains. And he did a really good job, but I thought maybe we could do better. So I got some data taken by the Space Shuttle um, in 2002. It had a big boom on the side of it, an 80 meter boom, and it measured the altitude of the Earth. So this is some data I plotted here for you. This is, uh, the color is altitude. So this is the ocean, this is Chile, this is Argentina, and the red is the Andes Mountains that run down um, between Chile and Argentina. Now, there are 1.6 billion data points in that map. So you can't use a normal computer to do this analysis, you need a supercomputer. And you have to begin to ask the question, what is a mountain? Which sounds like a strange question to ask, but let me describe the problem. If I have a mountain, a really high mountain, and on the side of that mountain there's a boulder, imagine a big boulder on the side of, a, of an enormous mountain, at what point is that boulder a separate mountain? And at what point is it just a lump on the side of a bigger mountain? Does that make sense? That's the question you have to ask, and you can solve it mathematically. And if you do, and you write some code, and you run it on the supercomputer, you can make a list of mountains. This was the first ever list that was made of mountains that was completely objective was automated, it's done using mathematics and data, not someone's opinion with a map. And so we discovered there were 106 mountains above 6,000 meters, so plenty for me to keep going up. But I also ran the code on mountains above 5,000 meters. And when I looked at the results, I realized that I had discovered dozens of mountains that didn't appear on any previous list that nobody had found before, that had no name and that had never been climbed. So, what do you do when you discover lots of new mountains that no one's ever climbed before? You go as fast as you can, buy a plane ticket to South America, and start climbing these mountains. And so, we would go, every, for the last few years we've gone every year, for a couple of months, two to three months, and climbed these particular mountains that have no name. And sometimes, we're surprised. So one time we were climbing, and we climbed for a couple of weeks, and we got to the summit of one of these mountains, and on the summit, we found a tower, a meter high. It was called, these towers are called Apochecas. They were built by the Incas. So that means 500 years ago, some Incas had climbed that mountain with none of the fancy equipment that we have, got to the summit, and built a tower on the top, and then left. And no one knew until we got there 500 years later. So this was an enormous surprise to us. And actually, it's a big open question. Why were the Incas climbing mountains? Why were they building towers on the top? And what did those towers mean? Why did they climb specific mountains over others? This is a really big open research question. Um, and we're addressing it by finding these ruins and identifying them. So, um, I wanted to keep climbing, as I said. I was running into difficulty because I wanted to do research, I wanted to climb. So these days, I never go on holiday to the mountains anymore. I only ever go on field trips to the mountains. So these days I do science when I go. So here, I'm collecting samples of ice and rock from inside this glacier. No one's been there before, so the, the samples are untouched. Here, I'm standing next to a really big lake, pretty high up, four and a half, five thousand meters. It's not frozen because it contains lots of impurities. But what that means is when the water evaporates, it leaves behind a layer of salt around the edge of the lake. So I was collecting the salt deposits and the ice and rock deposits 
because buried inside these deposits is a form of life. These are bacteria, and these are, the bacteria are called extremophiles. I'm sure some of you have worked with extremophiles. These are bacteria that have evolved to survive in this really extreme environment. And the reason I'm collecting these samples is because we're building an instrument that's going to Mars. And the instrument is going to Mars to look for life. The kind of life we think you might find are these bacteria buried under the surface of Mars. So by collecting these samples, I'm able to test our instruments and make sure that if these bacteria did exist on Mars, we would be able to detect them using our instruments. So this is what I like to do these days. So a couple of years ago, I had been climbing for a couple of months. And if you imagine being up in the mountains for months at a time, you don't have good food or any food really sometimes. You're cold for a long amount of time, you're tired. Every so often, you come down, maybe every couple of months, to get some food and some fuel and to have a hot shower and a warm bed. So I came down from the mountains and I went to a tiny village called Fianbala, which is a village of a few thousand people in Argentina. And I went to the village square and I opened up my computer because Fianbala has free public Wi-Fi in their town square. My city does not have free public Wi-Fi, so it's amazing that Fianbala, this tiny village, has free public Wi-Fi, but it does. So I opened up my computer and thousands of emails poured in. Of course they did, I've been gone for months. And one of them was an email from the BBC saying, do you want to be an astronaut? So I read this email and uh, I thought, well, yes, I think I'm going to apply. Why not just have a go? I'm going to send them an email back and say, my name's Susie, I'm a planetary scientist, I want to be an astronaut. So I sent this email back and uh, about three months later, I found myself standing on uh, a runway in the UK. They had had 12,000 applicants to be on their television programme. And they'd narrowed it down to the 12 people that you can see here on the screen in front of you. And these are 12 people who have the right qualifications to be an astronaut one day. So if you want to be an astronaut, uh, they really normally come from three different backgrounds. So this is people who are pilots, scientists, or doctors. So just to introduce you to some of these characters, to give you some examples. Um, so that's me, for a start, I should say that. That's me with my hat on. Um, that hat is now more famous than I am because I wore it throughout the show, so look out for the hat. Um, this guy is Crash. He's a surgeon um, from the UK, a really world-renowned surgeon. This is Hannah. She's a dental surgeon. This is Crash. He is involved in the design of space plane engines. Uh, let's see. This is Kerry. She's a pilot in the Royal Air Force. This is Tess. She's a commercial airline pilot. So you can see the kind of people that we have up there, people that have gone on to become scientists. Incidentally, every single one of the people on the screen did a science degree at university before they carried on, mostly physics or maths. Okay, so we've got some professional qualifications here, but that's not really enough. If you want to launch a group of people into space in a small tin can and keep them in one place for months at a time, then you want the kind of people that are able to get along with each other. You want people with other skills, not just science. So, I'll give you some examples. Merit, she was working on a PhD in quantum optics. She's also an international ballerina. James, James has a PhD in, uh, in energy management, but he's also on the Great Britain bobsleigh team. Uh, Hannah, Hannah's climbed Mount Everest. She's an elite runner from Ireland. You've heard about me and my mountains and running and all sorts of things. So, everyone has something else that makes them interesting. Just academics, that's not enough. You need to be a much more well-rounded person. So the reason I told you that whole story to start out with, of playing lacrosse and then rowing boats and then taking up mountaineering and kung fu and all these things, was to show you that it's really important to do things in your spare time that you enjoy, because that's what helps you grow these other skills. So I'm gonna show you some of the tests we had to do. And I want you to think about the fact that the fact that I'm a physicist doesn't matter. They didn't, never tested me on any equations or any maths. It was all about who I am as a person and what my character is like and whether I'm suited to being in space. Okay, so we start with 12. But the idea is that we end with one, the most likely person to be an astronaut in the UK. So, so 12,000 went down to 12, 12 go down to one. And we've got a judge. 
The judge is Commander Chris Hadfield. You might be a, it might be a name that's familiar to some of you. He's a very famous Canadian astronaut. He's been into space three times. He's the one that played the guitar in space. Have you ever seen a video of someone playing the guitar in space? I think some of you have. That's Chris Hadfield. So he's a really incredible uh, astronaut, and he's coming up with a test that we're doing here. So his job is to come up with a series of tests that will test us, so we can end up with one winner at the end. Bearing in mind, this is also going to be broadcast on national television, so it's quite a big risk as a scientist to decide to go on national television and be tested in this way. That felt like quite a big risk for me. So let's have a look at some of the tests. Okay, here is the first test. There's a clue here as to how this went. Um, this is a test. We never get any warning of the test we're about to do. So suddenly the test begins. Also, something that you should know is that at the very beginning, on day one, our mobile phones were taken away from us, which I know is the worst thing you can imagine, kids in the audience. Your mobile phone is taken away, your laptop is taken away, all contact with the outside world is removed. So no one, you can't phone a friend, your wallet and your credit cards, they're all gone too. You can't even buy a sandwich if you're hungry, okay? You're isolated. And you're not allowed to go anywhere without someone going with you. And this remains until you get thrown out of the program. So, it could be days, could be weeks, could be months, you don't know, okay? So that gives you a bit of background. Now the tests come at you one after the other. There are 44 tests, for those that got all the way to the end, in six weeks, and there's no feedback. So no one tells you if you did well or badly. There's no well done, you know, pat you on the head, good job, none of that. You just are able to keep continuing. So let's have a look at helicopter flying. This first test was to hover a helicopter for 15 minutes. Okay, that's what we're trying to do. I have never, at this point, have never been in a helicopter before. So really didn't know how to do this. Um, thankfully, neither did anyone else. So this is the astronaut in the middle, Chris Hadfield. This is a very brave pilot, just making sure we don't crash. This is her, and this is us. So this is the first candidate having a go. Okay, <laughs> not a great beginning. So keep watching. So here comes the second candidate. This is Prash, he's a surgeon. From, from Birmingham in the UK. Let's have a look at Prash hovering. Oh, okay, that's the second person. We're watching from, from the hangar nearby thinking, wow, this is not going well. Um, that's that's <coughs> Martin Hadfield looking disappointed. This is Hannah. She's a really good friend of mine. She's fantastic. She puts it into reverse. Just reverses straight on the screen. Going backwards. So we are not good at hovering the helicopter. And it turned out that some people were slightly worse than others, but no one was any good at this. And we were quite disappointed. You can imagine you're on national television, all your friends, your family, everyone's going to watch it. This is the first test, and you failed this badly. Imagine how you might feel. But, of course, we only found out months later. That was the whole point. It's impossible to step into a helicopter and know how to fly it. This was a test of failure. What happens when you fail so absolutely in such a public way? How do you react and how do you respond? And they're looking for characters who are constructive, who keep trying, who keep trying to improve. Some of us did that and other people got quite angry and quite frustrated at their own failures. So they're looking for the people that keep trying and keep going. Of course, we didn't know that. We thought we were expected to fly the helicopter. This is the second one. Um, this is one you can all do at home. This is a memory test. So again, you just walk into a room and you're told this is your test, it's about to start. So you'll see our candidates have to step up and down onto an aerobic step, that's Chris Hadfield, stepping up and down, up and down at any speed, while some numbers are read out to you in a sequence. Your job is to remember those numbers and repeat them backwards. Okay? Yeah. So. The average adult can remember five numbers and repeat them backwards. So we start with five, and you'll see some people having a go. If the number is white, the candidate got the, the number correct. So you can see some people doing well. So we start with five numbers. And if you get that right several times, then you try six. If you get six numbers right, you'll go on to seven. Then you'll go on to eight. Then you'll go on to nine, until you make a mistake. <laughs> One mistake, and that's it. Your test is over. You're not thrown out of the whole competition, but your test finishes there. So you can see that actually, this is quite a high pressure situation, a single mistake, and that's the end of your test. Yeah, 
So some people failed on five, some people got all the way to nine or ten numbers before they made a mistake. So this is not just a test of memory, it's a test of how cool you are under pressure. This is a very famous test called the bleep test. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I sense that some of you may have done the bleep test before. <laughs> okay. You know what this is. Alright, for those of you that don't know what it is though, I'm going to describe it to you so you, you can follow on. So the bleep test, as I'm sure many of you know, is a test that uh, is testing your cardiovascular ability, so your heart and your lungs. You start at one end of a big pool and you run to the other end. And you've got to get to that end before you hear a beep. You turn around, you run back again. You've got to get to that end before you hear a beep. And you just keep doing this backwards and forwards. It's a very simple test. The thing is though, the beeps get closer together in time. You've got to run faster and faster and faster to keep up. And if you miss three beeps, you're out. So this is commonly done in the forces, uh, in the army and the air force, it's done in the police force. Everyone ends up looking like that, sitting against the wall with a bottle of water. That's how it's meant to end. If you've really done your best, you're not really able to stand up at the end of it. So you can see that people are dropping out as they go along, as it gets harder and harder, um, and ending up sitting by the wall. Some people are doing really well and, and running for quite a lengthy period of time, as you can see. Um, this is important for astronauts. You know, when you send people into space, they're going to be there for six months at, at a time on the International Space Station, floating, not using their muscles at all, which means they waste away. So when they come back to the Earth, they often have to be carried out of the capsule. Um, their bones lose their density as well, which is really serious. So you need the healthiest people, yeah, that's me, healthiest people you can to be running backwards and forwards uh, to be sent into space. All right, so let's have a look at the next one. So we've gone from memory, to failure, we've tried running. Now let's see how emotionally resilient we are. So this test, again, is not what you might think. This lady is a clinical psychologist. She works for the European Space Agency. And she asked us to go into this room, sit right on the edge of this very uncomfortable chair. There's a light that's bouncing off the table into our eyes, and she asks us questions while looking straight into our eyes, without ever looking away, she asked a series of questions. And those questions start out quite straightforward. So she asked us, first question, what would you do with a million pounds? Okay, you think about your answer, you say something. And then she says, okay, what's the biggest mistake you've ever made in your entire life? And you think, well, I'm on national television, so I'm gonna think carefully before I answer that. And then she says, you get to go to Mars. And there are five people who want to go with you. You can choose only one. And to make that choice, you can ask only one question. What do you ask? Okay, so that really makes you think. I'm going to go to Mars. I've got to choose someone. I've got one question. What kind of thing am I going to ask? And you have to think carefully. The best answer I ever heard was uh, I asked this question to a group of six-year-olds. And one of them put up his hand. So I said, okay, what's your answer? And he said, it's a long way to Mars. There's limited food. I want to know how much he eats. <laughs> I want to make sure that I'm not going to be hungry. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't say that. Um, but you can see that she's asking us these questions, and she's, they're questions that make you think. So we thought that our words were very important. Turns out they weren't important at all. It didn't matter what we said. Because if I ask you a question that's tough, before you answer me, you're going to pause while you think. And in that moment, expressions will flash across your face. They support micro-expressions. You might look up to one side, you might lick your lips, you might tilt your head. That tells her everything she needs to know about how emotionally stable you are. So she puts you under an enormous pressure and she's watching how stable you are. You want people to launch into space who are very emotionally stable, who aren't apt to panic or get too emotional. And that's what she's testing here. So again, we didn't know any of this. All we knew was what we were being asked to do. This is like a swimming test with a twist. So I know many of you are swimmers, but this is not just about whether you can swim. So in this test, we were given only one instruction. I'll tell you that instruction in a moment. We were asked to put on a special suit and get into this capsule. Oh, you know what's coming. And put on a harness and they block the exits and they drop it into the swimming pool. But the thing is, there's holes in the bottom, so it sinks. 
So around about now, you have to take a really deep breath because this thing will now flip. Sometimes a little bit, sometimes it'll keep spinning and spinning and spinning. So now you're up, upside down, holding your breath, strapped into the capsule. And your job, our only instruction was to wait. Sit still and don't move. Wait, count to five after it stops moving because there's so many bubbles you can't see. And there's no point in trying to escape if you can't see where the exit is. So just hold your breath and wait till the bubble's clear. Then find an exit, push that exit out, release your harness and escape from the capsule. And everybody had to do this test in pairs four times. So the first time round it doesn't flip very far. Next time it keeps spinning. The next time one of the exits might be blocked. So you can't escape that way, you have to find another exit. So you see the test gets harder and harder. And everyone has to do this. So yes, this is a test of whether you can swim. If you can't swim, you are in, in a pickle at this point. Um, but also, can you stay calm under pressure? That's what they're really trying to find out. When you are under enormous pressure, do you see my hat? Yeah. Uh, can you stay calm or not? Now this is my really good friend, Hannah. She and I got into this capsule together. We were paired up. Hannah has been taught in an avalanche before, which means she's incredibly claustrophobic. So this test, the small spaces terrify her, and she was terrified of this test. But she got back into this capsule four times, even though she was terrified, and she managed to complete this test. And that showed incredible bravery on her part. She was much more brave than I was, because while I might have not been familiar with the situation and been nervous, she had a real phobia to overcome. So she showed incredible bravery going through this test, um, managing to complete the test four times. This one is, okay, so what I should tell you now is that if you're squeamish or you don't like the sight of blood, you're just not gonna watch, okay? Giving you lots of warning. Yep, just turn away if you don't like the sight of blood. You don't want anyone fainting, okay? It's not that bad, but I'm just giving you some warning, okay? Is everyone ready? Who's, who's watching? Okay, so. I am squeamish, which means that uh, I don't really, like I was not cut out to be a doctor. There's a good reason why I'm not a doctor. Um, what we discovered though, as we walked into this room, was that when we have astronauts in space, we want to know how their body is coping with the environment of space. And to make that judgment, we have to take blood samples from our astronauts. So, our job was to learn how to take blood samples. So we were given a set of instructions verbally, and we were able to practice. So. What you'll see is a person with a fake pad on their arm. It's a fake, a fake pad. And we were carrying out the procedure on that. So this is me, this is Tim, you can see he's got a fake pad on his arm. And if you get the procedure correct, then fake blood comes out. Okay? So this was all going well, I thought. I'm, I'm doing okay, I've managed to get the fake blood every time, so I feel like it's, it's, it's going all right, even though I'm a bit squeamish. And then the real test started. The real test is to take your own blood from out of your own arm, uh -huh. okay? So, I'm gonna go forward because I think some of you are probably quite squeamish and you don't want to see this. No. Oh, maybe you do, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so that changes the challenge, doesn't it? That changes everything. Now, now I really care about how well I'm doing. So you'll see a lot of these tests start one way and then at the end, something unusual happens. And this was a prime example. Taking your own blood is very different from pretending. So, the next one, there are three of us left in the competition. We started with 12. We have a chance to scuba dive to the bottom of the ocean in Florida, because bolted to the ocean floor is a training facility called Aquarius. It's where we train deep sea divers and astronauts. Very few people have been down here. We have this unique opportunity to go and visit this environment. And so there were three of us left and we dived to the bottom. We got on board and no sooner had we arrived, we were exploring, there was a kitchen and a dining room and a bedroom, it's amazing, there are fish swimming past the windows. Chris Hadfield phoned us up from the land and told us the carbon monoxide alarm is going off. Okay, so the air is poisoned. Right, we've got two choices here. We can try to escape from the capsule, but the thing is, we're on the bottom of the ocean, so we can't just swim to the surface, that's very dangerous. You get something called the bends, which is nitrogen bubbles in your blood. So that's not an option. We have to find a way to get fresh air from the surface down to the capsule at the bottom of the ocean. So we put on some oxygen masks, that gives us a bit of time, 30 minutes in fact. And we look around us and there are hundreds of dials and buttons everywhere. 
and we've got to work out which combination to press and which order to get fresh air down to us. So this is a test of logical thinking, something that physicists train for their whole lives. But it's also a test of teamwork. There are only three of us and no one person can complete this on their own. And finally, a test of leadership. So who steps forward and takes command and who stands back? That's what they're looking for here. So we completed the test with about a minute to spare at the end. But really what they cared about was how we interacted as a group. This is my favorite test. This is called a centrifuge. So I think you know what this is already because I can see some of you <laughs> doing a demo for me. Yeah, this is a test where we want to see how people's bodies respond to high G-forces. This is commonly used for um, fighter pilots in fast jets to see how their body responds. So this room is enormous. I am, this window is taller than I am to give you a sense of scale. This arm here weighs 35 tons. There's a pod on the end and the pod spins in a circle. At top speed, it will do one lap of the room in just under two seconds. Whatever is inside that pod will feel 15 times the force of gravity. We don't put people in at 15 G, but we do put people in up to 9 G. We have a chance to see what this is like. So I'm, I'm showing you my really good friend Tim here because Tim has the funniest face. So we just want you to watch his face really closely and you'll see how he's feeling. So he's asked to put on a harness. He's got a heart rate monitor on because it's really tough on the heart and he starts spinning faster and faster than the people up there. Okay, so he's talking, which is great. And you're about to see, you know, he's, he's, he's smiling, which is really good. But watch his cheeks really closely, because there's a moment there. <laughs> does not look well. So he's feeling a force from front to back, which is squashing his lungs and making it hard to breathe. He's also feeling a force from his head to his feet which means his body is finding it really hard to pump blood up to his brain. So what happens is that if you don't get enough blood in your brain, you're going to pass out, you're going to faint. So your first warning sign is that your eyesight starts to fail because your eyes are very sensitive to the amount of oxygen they receive. So your eyesight starts to narrow into tunnel vision and it turns black and white. And as soon as you see that happening, your job is to tighten your leg muscles and your stomach muscles as tightly as you can that stops the blood from flowing to your feet and it forces it into your brain and you stay conscious. So that's our job. Meanwhile, the night before, Commander Hadfield had given us a piece of paper with the Russian alphabet on it. So the Russian letter and how you pronounce it. Just for interest. Okay, but nothing is just for interest. So the following day, as we were spinning around at 5G in the centrifuge, Russian words were appearing on the screen. And our job <laughs> was to read out these Russian words because we knew how the characters were going to <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so what are we testing here? This sounds a bit mad, doesn't it? Why am I reading Russian at 5G? Well, if I launch into space, my body might feel really uncomfortable, but my brain has to still be working properly. We're testing whether we're cognitively sound, even though our body's under an enormous stress. So that's what this test was all about. Okay, the last one. We're in a plane. And this plane is in Florida. And it flies in a special way. So the plane flies like this. Okay? And it does that for a whole hour. So we get 15 of these loops. Now, the reason we're doing this is because as we go over the top of our loop, everything in the plane lifts and floats. Floats around for about 25 seconds. Then the plane comes down and we lie down flat on the ground and we wait because we feel squashed. We feel twice the force of gravity. The plane comes up and we start floating again. And we have a chance to really feel what it's like to float in space. Now, for the television, they had asked us to do one, uh, one, one trick uh, pretending to be Superman flying along, okay? Superman flying along. So you can see we're trying to do that. This is the real astronaut up here, right? He's doing a pretty good job. <laughs> we are so happy. <laughs> but we're not very good, so let's have a look. So we start out lying on the floor, and then suddenly we just start floating. And we bounce off the ceiling, we bounce off the walls, bounce off each other. <laughs> this is our Superman shot. <laughs> wildly. If you start spinning, you can't stop spinning. If you push off a wall, you don't stop till you hit the other wall. So there's lots of things to think about. Meanwhile, we've got a test to do. And our test is to take a camera, put a film into the camera, 
fly to Commander Hadfield, take his photograph, which will pop out, and then sign our name on it. And we've got three parabolas each, about 90 seconds each to complete this test. So if I gave it to you on the Earth, you'd find it quite straightforward, but it's way harder when you're floating wildly because you lose your sense of direction. If you let go of an object, it floats away and you can't get it back. So you've got to be very careful with all the objects in your hands. So at the very end of my test, I was running out of time. So I had one parabola left to take this photograph. So I pushed really hard off my side of the plane like this. Crashed straight into my <laughs> off and signed it really quickly. Tim turned the camera on and off five times and never found a button to take the photograph. So you can see how hard this really is. It's very, very tricky. <laughs> Meanwhile, one of the cameramen halfway through had in his pocket, this is super nice idea, had in his pocket an entire packet of Skittles. <laughs> The aircraft, and we threw around with our mouths open trying to eat the food. <laughs> we had a lot of fun doing this. Alright, so this was an amazing experience. I'm so lucky that I had the chance to do this. I feel really fortunate. I made some lifelong friends as part of this experience. We, were, we did 44 tests, as I mentioned. It took us six and a half weeks to complete this challenge. Um, and I learned a lot about myself, I learned a lot about what I need to improve on, what I can do better, um, and uh, just had this amazing experience, I'm so fortunate I took part. So hopefully that's given you all a few ideas about mountaineering or space science or being an astronaut one day, um, and I think I'm out of time so I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, have 
I put into space? That's a good question, yeah. Okay, so the answer sadly is no. I've not been into space yet. Um, the prize for the show is an interesting one. It was not a ticket into space, I'm sad to say. I wish there had been a ticket into space. The prize for the show was a letter recommending me, written by Commander Hadfield, to the European Space Agency. So the next time they have a, a, a call out for astronauts, I'll have a letter recommending me. But also, I'll have done some of the things that they're looking for. I have a much better idea of what the process is. So that's the prize. The problem is the last time that they that they put out a call for astronauts was 11 years ago, when the last astronauts were selected. And they might decide they want more tomorrow, or it could be five years away. So I don't know when I'll have a chance to apply, but um, we'll have to see. Fingers crossed. Oh, there's one at the back over there. Yeah, we can dash around. Someone moving at speed. Who ended up winning the show? Oh, so I won the show. Yeah. <laughs>